All right, folks, so welcome to this. Well, that's blurry. All right, come on, auto focus. Good, good. So, we're here for this third video. It's going to be much shorter than the other two because uh, there's only about a few, a few other ideas to discuss. Um, <clears throat> so, the, the idea here is uh, we want to talk about the complement of a set. Um, now, in order to, to introduce that idea, I'll just do a little tangent to talk a little bit more about the uh, intersection of a connection. So, we looked at the idea of an intersection, and we saw that this only made sense if we said explicitly that the collection was not empty and that it had to contain at least one set. Otherwise, we're going to run into trouble that's going to lead us to stuff just like Russell's paradox, and we certainly do not want that. That would be a contradiction. It's very, very bad. Now, often, we're only interested with uh, objects that are in a particular set. And here I'm going to call it E to say something like our environment. The, it's not an exactly a good term, it's just like the, the, those things that we actually happen to want to talk about. So we have a set E with all its members, and then that might contain a bunch of subsets, right? Subset, subset. Maybe a third one. You know, a bunch of subsets could be a subset of E, right? So in this case, we could think of a connection of subsets of E and rewrite our definition of intersection as follows. And since there's a change, that particular notion we're going to call the relative intersection. Then we would write that x is in the relative intersection if and only if, well, maybe I should not write it like that. I should say that the uh, relative intersection by definition would be the set of objects that are in the environment, right? All those objects have to be in the environment. And then we just write for all S, if S is in the collection, then X is in S. Now, here, if the connection happens to be the empty set, as we saw, that's going to uh, guarantee that the antecedent of that membership condition is always false, so that the conditional is always true. And that would suggest that everything is in the intersection. But now here, since it's a relative intersection that we got by the, from this particular application of uh, the, the separation principle, all that would tell us is the following. It would tell us that this is trivially satisfied, so this part does all the work. In fact, if um, if the collection of set is empty, then the intersection of the collection is just the set E. That's trivially satisfied, so all we are left is X is in E. So that's a notion that is very often useful. When people talk about intersections without going in the strictures of specifying why the collection has to be non-empty and things like that, they're not saying it, but what they have in mind is the notion of relative intersection. Okay? Uh, now, that's, that can be delicate because given a certain application, it might not be so obvious how we will characterize that environment. But despite that, it's very, very useful, very, very often to do so. Now, just like the notion of relative 
intersection is useful. There's another one which is quite useful, which is the complement of A. And normally we just write A with a little bar over it. And now I'm going to write it in red because that's going to be mistaken and we're going to have to fix it. But the basic idea is that that's the, collect, that, that's the set of things that are not in A. Right? In terms of Venn diagrams, what do we have? Well, that's our sort of environment, so to speak, our universe of this course. We have the set A, and the complement is everything that is not in the set A, all the outside of it. So that's the complement of A. Now, why is this definition a little bit too loose? Well, because what about the complement of the empty set? Huh? Following that idea, that would be the set of all the objects that are not in the empty set. But that's the same as saying the set of things that are identical to themselves, which includes everything. So again, that would give us a set of all sets which could be used to generate the Russell paradox. Well, that, that would make our, make our theory of sets inconsistent. So we definitely do not want to do that. But we see that the only mistake that we made here was by using the comprehension principle that we ruled out. So if we just specify an environment, then we're going to be okay. Because then the complement of the empty set is just going to be the set E. And this is why very often, instead of this, we're going to write things like E minus A equals this. Or more generally, things like B minus A equals the set of objects that are in B, but also that are not in A. Okay, so that's the complement. In fact, to be precise, it's the relative complement, relative to E. Because again, the absolute complement would lead us to self-contradiction, and we don't want that. Now, the relative complement is tightly connected to the negation in sentential logic, so some of the properties you're going to recognize. So first property, A, the complement of the complement of A is just A. You know, that's like double negation. Should we try to prove that quickly? Let's try. So first, we're going to try to show that the complement of the complement of A is a subset of A. So we're going to suppose that some object is in the double complement and then try to show that it's in A as a result. Now, since we're using the notion of relative complement for some set E, the environment, a is going to be part of E minus A. Um, and that means that A, oh, I should have, I forgot uh, the, the Fitch style idea. Or to be more precise, I'll, I'll do it with the relative complement. That means A is in E and A is not in A. And you can flip this around to get the second membership condition of complement. So that means A is in E and A is not in complement of A. Right? 
So now we uh, can do a conjunction elimination to focus just on that part. Now, if A is not in this, that means that the membership condition is false. So the membership condition here would be A is in E, and furthermore, A is not in A. So that is false. Right? Now, here we have A is in E. So by conjunctive syllogism, what do we get? We get that this is false. So it's not the case that A is not in A. And remember, this is just a shorthand for a negation. So by double negation, we get this here. And that's conjunctive syllogism. And here again, that's by the membership condition of complement, but the negated version. So this is how that would, that would look like in terms of a proof. Again, it's written in prose in the notes with a lot of details. I invite you to look at that carefully as you prepare for uh, the next homework assignments. Here are a few other properties. So the second one says that the complement of the empty set is E. The third one says that the complement of E is the empty set. All fairly intuitive, I hope. Now, what do you think is the intersection of A and the complement of A? That's the empty set. There is nothing there. Nothing to see here. Move on. The union of A and its complement is, well, the entire environment. Then we have something similar to our contraposition in logic. A is a subset of B. If and only if negation B is a subset of negation A. And finally, we have a couple of familiar faces. Call it, I don't know, 7 and 8. The complement of a union is the intersection of the complements. That's a De Morgan law as you see. And similarly, we have A intersection B equals complement of A union complement B. And that's also a De Morgan law. So again, those are not super hard to prove. There's, they're they're going to make for good exercises. Um, I'm not going to give much more details than that. I think that should be enough. But if not, don't hesitate to get in touch with me. And I'll be happy to go through a, a couple exercises with you as well, uh, if needed. Uh, now I'm feverish, so I'm trying to not uh, stretch up too much. I'm just going to mention one last thing that is very common in set theory. And it's. Um, I don't like the symbol, but the symbol plus is often used for it. And that's called, uh, that's called the symmetric difference. Sometimes it's called disjoint union, uh, which is a name that's a bit more intuitive, but I don't think it makes quite a bit of sense uh, for reasons that well, will emerge one day. That is just the following, which is the set of objects, again, in some environment, such that um, such that um, um, X, well, okay, sorry, normally that's not how it's defined. Normally it's defined 
using equality. A plus B by definition is A intersection not B union B intersection not A. And in terms of Venn diagram, that's what it gives us. So A intersection not B is this, and B intersection not A is this. So as you see, it includes everything in A and B except what's in both. So it's a bit like the exclusive or in propositional logic. Again, there are a few properties of those. They're much, much less important than the properties of conjunction and disjunction or uh, intersection and union. So I'm not going to, uh, to talk much about that. I might throw you one as an exercise in the assignment. But all right, that's it for chapter five. So I, I hope that it's going to be okay. Um, you do let me know, please, if uh, you're running out of air and <laughs> that you feel like you're drowning. Um, and otherwise, uh, well, I look forward to moving on to the next chapter because that's when we start doing um, a little bit more uh, interesting constructions using sets. All right, so stay safe, wash your hands, and do all the stuff that they keep saying on TV. All right, cheers.